Two, one, two. There we go. Good evening. Happy Wednesday to you. Hopefully you've had a great week so far, and we have a great way to start uh, our service tonight, and that is with baptism. So at this time, I'm going to turn our service over to Pastor Corey Olivier and let him help us celebrate in a believer's baptism. Well, this is unusual, but man, this is a good unusual, and so uh, I'm excited to uh, to bring Margie uh, into the baptismal waters. Come on, Margie. So let's open up. Father, uh, what a great night this is to worship you and to uh, start off with a celebration of someone who is publicly proclaiming their faith and trust in you. And I pray that, Lord, uh, we would be able to be a church that could help support that and help continue to encourage folks to uh, just come to you as, as, as they are and uh, repent from their sins. And then, Father, may we be faithful in discipling them and helping them on their journey of faith uh, uh, with their trust in you. And so tonight we praise you for uh, Margie coming and for proclaiming uh, the truth that is only found in your word and the truth and hope that can only be found in you. So Father, tonight as we uh, continue on with our service, may we worship you with those things in mind. In thy name we pray. Amen. All right. Well, as we celebrate, I'm going to make a little noise over here. I want us to stand together. We're going to sing a little bit as we uh, get our service started. And uh, as we do that, we're going to sing a song. I hadn't sung it in a little while, but it's a great one that talks about blessing the Lord and thanking Him for who He is. So let's stand together this evening, and let's start off with a great hymn, uh, starting with, I Will Bless the Lord. So here we go. Oh 
praised amen? amen amen and tonight we've seen through baptism how the lord can break those chains of bondage and how he can free us and give us a hope that we've never had before and so tonight i want to sing about that amazing grace that margie has just professed as we continue our time Forever, my. 
Tim. There we go. Well, good evening to everybody who's here. Good to see everybody. For those of you who are watching online, good evening to you as well. And uh, we're uh, excited. Man, there's nothing better to start a Wednesday night service than with baptism. It doesn't happen very often, but praise Jesus that it did. And so excited that uh, to be a part of a church where God is at work and is moving. And uh, uh, I, I have it under pretty good uh, authority that uh, the baptistry will be filled again here, rec- here very soon, as I believe we have at least one other who has come to faith in Christ this week, and uh, who will be, we'll be celebrating hopefully this Sunday uh, that decision, uh, letting them know, letting the church know about it. But uh, tonight what I want to do is keep working in a practical sense on studying the Bible. And so uh, for the next few weeks, we're going to look at tools for the spiritual tool belt. So some practical things that you can do, that you can do at home to better study the Bible. We began last week by talking about how, what it means to have a quiet time and have a personal worship time with the Lord. And I believe that is foundational, that every believer in Christ should spend time with the Lord. I visited with one of our young adults this week, young lady, came to my office. She said, hey, can I meet with you? I said, sure. We've got it scheduled. I had no idea. Uh, what she wanted to meet about. And so my mind always goes to the worst possible thing, and then we just trickle down to the best possible thing. Well, it was the, one of the best possible things. She sat down in my office, and she had two journals with her, and she's like, I've got a prayer journal, and I have a journal that I'm kind of recording, like, my thoughts about things I read in the Bible and stuff, but I'm so confused. Like, I don't know what to do. I have so many, so many things in my head. Like, can you help me make sense of it all? And I was like, yes, those are the kind of conversations I love to have. And so begin to walk with her and begin to show her how to systematize her thoughts and how to, how to write in her prayer journal and how to journal other things as well. And, but to see her excitement because her desire is she wanted to spend time in God's word. And she also wanted to be able to record what God was saying to her while she was spending time in it. And so I uh, got a chance to spend about an hour with her in my office, kind of beginning the steps of teaching her that. And uh, we've agreed to meet every other week to kind of help her get this process going so that she feels more comfortable in, in growing in her faith. Because one thing I talked about with her is maturity in our faith is not all cognitive. Now, it's part of it. We should spend time in God's Word. We should study God's Word because we want to know more about God's Word. So there's an aspect of our faith, there's an aspect of maturing in Christ that is cognitive, but it's not the biggest part. The biggest part of growing in your faith or, or managing those leaps of faith that God calls you to give. And this is how I explained it to her. I was like, did you, anybody ever teach you how to swim? She's like, yeah. I said, most probably they started off by, they were in the very shallow end of the pool, and they said, jump and I will catch you. Probably you were pretty small, right? She goes, yeah, something like that. And so every time you jumped in and they caught you, you had more trust, right? She said, yeah. I said, then perhaps they moved to a deeper end, maybe like the four or five foot end of the pool. And they said, all right, I want you to jump and catch. Now they were still able to stand on their feet, but the water was much deeper. But because they caught you over here in the shallow, you trusted that they would catch you here in the five foot end. And they did, didn't they? She said, yes. I said, and eventually maybe they got into the very deep where the diving board is and they made you get on the diving board and there they were treading in 12 feet of water or 10 feet of water. They couldn't put their feet on the ground either. But they said, hey, jump and I'll catch you. And I said, I bet you were a little nervous. She goes, I was. I said, but did you jump? She said, I did. Did they catch you? They did. And I said, why did you believe that they would catch you in the 12 feet of water? It was because they caught me in the 5 feet of water. Because they caught me in the shallow end. And that's how our faith grows. That's how we mature. You see, God, we trust God. God delivers for us. And so then when God says, I want you to jump instead of from here to here, I want you to jump from here to here. I look back and I'm like, God, you caught me in the shallow. I'm going to trust that you're going to catch me here. So next time God wants to make a leap of faith, over here, I look back and say, God, you've trusted, I trust you because you were with me there and you were with me there and I know that you want me to do this and so I trust you and I do it. That's how we grow in our faith. That's how we mature in our faith. But the bedrock of being able to do that is we know God by experience and we know by God by experience by first knowing him in his word. Okay? That is bedrock. That is foundational. So tonight what I want to do, and, and I don't know if we'll get through the whole thing tonight. If not, we'll stop halfway and we'll pick it up next week, 
is I want to give us 10 principles of how to study your Bible or to do theological study. Now, I wish I could say that I was the one that came up with these 10 principles, but I ripped them out of a good friend of mine's book. Um, and so I will give him the credit whenever we get to him, and uh, just in case he happens to be watching tonight. Um, and so, but, uh, but I'll give you these. We'll probably, we'll probably want to get through five of them tonight. But I'll give you these five. We'll do the other five next week. And, but before we do that, I'll, I do want to read some scriptures. I think it's obviously important uh, for us to, to if we're going to study God's Word, we should read God's Word. So here's three passages that I kind of just picked out that I think are good foundational passages for why we should study God's Word. The first one, uh, if you've worked in Awana, this is going to be kind of familiar to you. 2 Timothy 2.15, be diligent to present yourself to God as one approved a worker who doesn't need to be ashamed, correctly teaching the word of truth. Now, context, this is Paul to his protege, Timothy, who's a young pastor. And he's saying, listen, you, you don't need to be ashamed. You need to be diligent in your study so that when you get up in front of the people and you teach God's word, you do so boldly, you do so confidently. Um, that's one of the things that as I try to teach young preachers growing up who were interns for me is that, look, study, 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 be prepared. When you get up in front, be, get up and be confident in not so much maybe your speaking ability, but be confident in God's word. Be confident that God's word can do crazy things. Listen, I have gotten up and, and have preached the best sermon I've preached, right? And, 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 and nothing happened. And then somebody, one of these students gets up and they bumble and fumble and stumble their way through a Bible study. And all of a sudden, we got people getting saved left and right. And I'm like, what's up with that? But it's not about the orator or the experience of the orator. It's about God's word and God's spirit working. But it's important that if you're going to get up, <clears throat> whether you're going to get up as a pastor to preach or you're going to get up as a Sunday school teacher to teach or a Bible study leader to lead a Bible study or whatever environment that you are leading and teaching God's Word, that you are confident in God's Word, that you've prepared and that you're good to go. Another passage there in 2 Timothy uh, verse, chapter 3, verses 16 and 17, it says, All Scripture is inspired by God and is profitable for teaching for rebuking, for correcting, for training in righteousness, so the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. All Scripture is inspired by God. Everything from Genesis through Revelation is inspired and errant Word of God. And so all of it has a purpose in teaching us something. Now, not all of it is always applicable to us at every moment, all right, or to every age group. In other words, I'm not going to take our third and fourth graders through Song of Solomon, just, you know, that's just not applicable to them. It's still inerrant. It's still inspired. It's just not appropriate for them, right? So, but there, but all of God's word can be used to teach us something, especially as adults. There is something that God's word can teach us, even in some of the most, you know, places that you would think there isn't much in there, even through some of those genealogies. Man, there's sometimes you get a hold of something and it's like, Wow. I think one of my favorite moments of reading a genealogy was when it dawned on me that in the genealogy of Jesus, do you know who's mentioned in Jesus' genealogy? Anybody want to take a guess? Rahab, the harlot from Joshua, who hid the spies. She is in the genealogy of Jesus. How about that as redemption, Right? pretty stinking cool all right so even in some of the most craziest most boring if you will things like i love the book of leviticus most people that get to leviticus in their bible reading plan they're like i'm done <laughs> but i love the book of leviticus i love the imagery there of of redemption and of of sacrifice and all those things because it points to christ it points to what Christ would eventually do for us. Um, one last passage, Psalm 119. If you want a chapter in the Bible, it's the longest chapter in the Bible, but if you want a chapter that's just saturated with why we should spend time in God's Word, Psalm 119 is it. Let me read verses 97 and 105. It says, How I love your instruction. It is my meditation all day long. Your command makes me wiser than my enemies, for it is always with me. I have more insight than all my teachers because your decrees are my meditation. I understand more than the elders because I obey your precepts. I have kept my feet from every evil path to follow your word. I have not turned from your judgments, for you yourself have instructed me. How sweet your word is to my taste, sweeter than honey in my mouth. 
I gain understanding from your precepts, therefore I hate every false way. And this is probably the most familiar of the, of the passage. Your word is a lamp for my feet and a light on my path. All right? That's a verse that many of us, if we grew up in the church, we memorize as a child. It's part of our VBS, all right? part of the, the Pledge of Allegiance to the Bible. That verse is kind of built in as the centerpiece of that little, uh, little speech, that, that, that pledge that we do to the Bible. But your word is a lamp into my feet and a light into my path. And I love that because it, it indicates two very important things. It's a lamp into my feet. I think I may have mentioned this on a Sunday. It's kind of like a night light. You wake up in the middle of the night, you don't want to stub your toe on the, on, the, on the side of the bed, so you sometimes you put night lights or some light so you can see. And God's word is for us, it's an immediate step by step. But oftentimes, it's a light into our path. It reminds us that the journey we're going down, we have to trust the Lord, but just know that there is a light that's leading the way. Just as in the, the nation of Israel, as they were going through the wilderness, God was what? He was a fiery light at night and a cloud by day. There was always a leadership. God's word is that for us. It is that light to our path and that lamp to our feet. So let's jump into these 10 steps. Dr. Ryan Putnam, good friend of mine, uh, was a longtime uh, professor at New Orleans Seminary, is now uh, a professor at Williams Baptist College in Arkansas, is also in their administrative as a VP for something. Um, and so, but, uh, but just a wonderful, wonderful man of God and a wonderful theologian. Uh, and one of his books um, had these, and I was reading it the other day, and I thought, man, this would be good for us to... Um, to go through. So uh, I think we're going to go for the second time tonight. We'll go through the first five, and then we'll pick up the next five next week. Number one, if you're taking notes, it'll also be on the screen. Um, we kind of talked about this last week, but I want to reemphasize it because he put it as number one. Regularly read and prayerfully meditate on the written Word of God. So if you want to study God's Word well, if you want to have effective theological study, you have to read and prayerfully meditate on the written word of God. Okay? <clears throat> you have got to spend time in God's word. I am so grateful for all the compliments that I, I've gotten from you, how you've enjoyed the sermons and how you, how you enjoy the way I teach and I explain things, break it down so it's very easy to understand. That, I appreciate that. That fact, to me, that's the greatest compliment that to me as a Bible teacher that I can get is that you understand the Bible better. Okay, there's not a better compliment that I can get about my teaching. But here's the thing. If all you're doing is meditating and listening to me once or twice a week, it's not enough. You need to be inside God's Word every day. Now, for some of you, you're like, well, Pastor, I, I'm not used to that. I don't know that I can carve out a ton of time. You can start somewhere. I'm not saying you've got to start at 30 minutes or an hour but you can start at 5 or 10 or 15 minutes. We all have that amount of time that we easily, some of us blow on social media alone. And so you can carve out some time to do it. In fact, kind of a reminder, a quick reminder of last week, you should have a place, you should have a plan, and you should have a positive mindset. Let me explain that last one here in a second. But a place, have a designated place that you do your personal worship time, whether that's in your bedroom, at your dining room table, uh, maybe you have a home office, maybe you have to do it in your dorm room if you're a college student, you, wherever it might be. It might be in your vehicle at lunch where you have total silence, nobody can bother you, but find a place. Next, have a plan. Uh, I'll tell you what a plan is not. A plan is not just taking your Bible and just opening it up and be like, oh, 1 Corinthians 2, that looks cool. And that's a great, I mean, it's a great chapter, but it's not a plan. Have a plan. Start John chapter 1. Start in Matthew 1. Start in, start in the first of, of a book. It could be a gospel. It could be one of Paul's letters. It could be the Old Testament. Maybe you want to read the Bible in the next 12 months. You don't have to wait until January. You can start that now. And you can have a Bible reading plan in a year. There's lots of those. I mentioned last week, and I'll mention several resources tonight, but the U version, Y-O-U, version bible app you can download it for free you can download every english translation there is and so it comes default with the king james but you don't have to use the king james you can put the csb which is what i teach and preach from mostly and so you can put that one in your phone if you want to have that to read along with, with the translation that i use but every other translation is in there new king james esv niv nasb you name it 
It's in there. And so you can use that. And with that app, there are Bible reading plans. That's what I use. I open my phone every morning. I go to my Bible reading plan. I open my Bible and I read. Now, there's some mornings, if I have a headache or whatever, I'll hit the play button. It'll read the scripture to me. Or <clears throat> there have been some days, especially when I was in New Orleans, I have to leave really early. I would throw it on through my Bluetooth on my vehicle and I would listen to it as I drove. So there's lots of ways that you can take Bible intake, but you want to meditate on it. You want to take seriously what you read. Sometimes, if you're like me, you're reading stuff and your mind begins to think of other things. I'm, I'm a type A, very task-driven person, and so I'm already thinking about at 5 o'clock in the morning what I have to do when I get in the office at 9. And the Lord's like, no, 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 go back and reread that. You missed that because we'll take care of 9 o'clock at 9 o'clock. You, you know, and so I, like this morning, it happened to me. I had to go back and reread the psalm I was reading that morning just to make sure I got it and I understood it. All right, so, so have a place, <clears throat> have a plan, have a positive mindset. What do I mean by that? Go into your quiet time with the expectation that God will speak. Go in with the expectation that God will speak. Now, he will not speak audibly, at least most probably, not like I'm doing. If he does, if you're like me, you'll be scared to death, okay? But he will speak through his word. He will illuminate, the Holy Spirit will illuminate something that will be for you, either an answer to a prayer or something that he wants you to meditate on because it's something that he may be directing you toward in the future, okay? So God will speak, but you have a positive mindset that God will do so. So number one, regularly read and prayerfully meditate on the written word of God. Number two, engage the biblical text, tradition, and culture with listening ears and thoughtful questions, okay? So engage the biblical text, tradition, and culture with listening ears and thoughtful questions. Uh, I want you to know as your pastor, there's times I'm studying the Word, and uh, I come across things that I don't understand. So don't feel bad if you come across things you don't understand. And then I have to turn around and say, okay, well, what does this mean? Or well, I have to consult resources that I have at my availability, go back and look and see, okay, what does this mean? Or how does this fit in context? That kind of stuff. There, there are things that the Bible describes that are tradition for that time period that we're foreign to, and so we don't understand them. So we have to kind of figure that out so we have a better understanding. That's why whenever I, I, I prepare to preach and teach, I try to do a lot of background study because I want to bring that to my sermons and to my teaching. I always feel like it helps make the words on the page explode. It helps you when you can kind of visualize things or you have a better understanding of what's going on in the background that as you read that passage on your own, you may remember that and it'll help you understand it better. But here are some questions that will, will come up when you're just reading the text. And I just picked some random ones that he kind of put in the book. Uh, you may be reading and you may uh, ask, well, what does blasphemy of the Spirit mean? I, I read that phrase. What, is, what does that mean? Or maybe what exactly is the gift of tongues described in, in 1 Corinthians? You know? Or maybe one, you're reading through Revelation, you get to Revelation chapter 20, you're like, well, what does it mean that there's a thousand-year reign of Christ? Is that a literal thousand years? Or is it just representative of a long period of time? There's lots of debate over those two interpretations in particular of the millennial reign of Christ. So what exactly does it mean? All right, depending on who you talk to, depending on who you read, you can read into either one of those. You can read some that would say there is no really millennial reign of Christ, and I don't agree with that one, but whatever. Um, but you have some people that, that fall into that camp. So there are, there are questions that you're going to come up with. And, and here's what I used to tell my students. Write those down. Now, we have so many resources, and I'll get to that in a second, available to us via the Internet. Uh, but I would always tell my students, and I'll tell you this, write those questions down, and if you can't find the answer, bring those to me call me, email me with those questions. I still do that. To, like, if I come across something that I cannot figure out an answer for, after looking up in my library or my online resources, uh, I, I have the privilege of knowing lots of seminary professors, and so I will call them directly or email them directly and say, listen, I need your help. I don't understand this. And typically within 24 hours, they'll go back with me. But I'll be happy to answer those questions if I can. And if I can't, I will find the answer for you. But sometimes you'll get doctrinal questions that will arise uh, that will cause you to read from not only within, but outside your church tradition to have a complete understanding. Understand, there is a large umbrella of orthodoxy under Christian doctrine 
that as brothers and sisters, you can look at a passage one way, and another brother or sister can look at it a slightly different way, and both of you still stand on the umbrella of orthodoxy. Okay? All right? There are lots of doctrines that I would describe as what I call open-handed theological doctrines. Those are the doctrines that we can have a gentleman and ladylike disagreement on and still be under the umbrella of orthodoxy. Now, there are some close-handed theological doctrines that we cannot, we cannot falter from. Salvation is by grace through faith in Christ alone. That's close-handed. Okay? For me, baptism by immersion after salvation is close-handed. Now, I have brothers who believe in, in infant baptism, not as salvictic, but just as kind of what we call baby dedication. I totally disagree with that. I don't think it's biblical. I can still have fellowship with those guys and gals, and I do. But for me, baptism by immersion after salvation is important. It's, it's a close-handed thing. Um, and so uh, uh, the virgin birth of Christ, that's a close-handed theological thing. All right? The second coming of Christ, close-handed. When that second coming is going to happen, open-handed. Okay? Lots of views on that that fall under the umbrella of orthodoxy that I can have a view and Bill could have a view, and, and, and anybody else, could, Philip could have a view, and we all may have different, slightly varying views of that, and it's okay. And amongst our little huddle at Waffle House, we can argue with one another and try to prove why we're right, and then we leave, we leave as brothers in Christ, believing that Christ is coming back. We just hold a slightly very variant of when that might happen or quite how that might happen. That's okay. All right. So those kind of questions will come up as you're studying. Be prepared for that. Um, how, how do things I've experienced match what the Bible says? Or how can the Bible answer questions I have found from my experience? So we have to be very, very careful with our experiences because our experiences need to match Scripture. So, uh, you know, I, I love, I've, I've mentioned this, I love Henry Blackaby experiencing God. And one of the things that he explains in that study is uh, we hear God speak through the Bible through prayer, through the church, and through circumstances or experiences. But what I've appreciated about Dr. Blackaby is that when he talks about experiences or circumstances, he always says, you take those and you bring those back to God's Word. You cannot view experiences on their own. Okay? You can't just say, oh, well, I experienced this or, or, or this circumstance happened. If it doesn't line up with God's Word, it's not from the Lord. All right? So we take our experiences, we take our circumstances that happen, we bring them back to God's Word, and we see, does it line up with Scripture? If it doesn't, then it wasn't from God. Okay? So that's how you deal with experiences and how you relate your experiences back to God's Word. All right, number three, uh, collect all the biblical materials relevant to the question or problem, and then study them by priority. So what do I mean by this? Well, there are lots of resources that you have at your disposal today that say 10 years ago, 20 years ago, that mainly unless you were a pastor or unless you were just a student, uh, a lay student of God's word, you didn't really have many resources. In fact, I would say the only resource that most people had uh, 20 years ago that were not pastors or just lay students of God's word was the first thing I, I put on my list here, which is, a good study Bible. Yeah. Study Bibles have been around for a while, and so there are lots of good study Bibles that are out there. And so uh, I will tell you, at, during October, and especially around Christmas, um, Lifeway in particular, but other Christian bookstores and probably Amazon as well, will put those on sale. Uh, I, I got, we got blessed uh, before Lifeway went out of the brick and mortar business. Uh, we bought a ton of the uh, CSB and ESV study Bibles for 20 bucks a piece. Uh, I, I gobbled up like 20 of each, and we put them in, our, uh, in my office at the BCM. And here was the thing is that I bought them for one reason. As students came to me and showed a desire to really study God's Word, we gifted them a study Bible. We said, this is foundational. This is where you start at. Because there's great notes in there. There's great cross-references. There's usually an appendix in the back that's got not only a good concordance, but uh, kind of an abridged Bible dictionary and all kind of things in them. So if you really want to bring your study of God's Word up a notch um, without breaking the bank, a good study Bible would be where I would recommend. And a lot of the translations probably the one maybe that you're even using, 
there is a study Bible for it. Like I said, there's the CSB study Bible, there's the NIV study Bible, there's the ESV study Bible, there's probably several King James study Bibles, and then there's other study Bibles that have been written or edited, I should say, edited by other theologians or pastors that many of you probably know about and may even enjoy and they have those in several different translations like i have a copy of i love john macarthur i have his whole commentary set i've got a macarthur study bible in new king james uh, i also ordered one it should be coming in here soon uh the new legacy standard bible a new translation that's recently come out i've ordered it in the macarthur study bible so that's going to be my bible of for devotion in 2025 i'm going to spend the year reading through it kind of seeing how much i like it compared to the CSB and other translations. But I'll use the notes that are in it from the MacArthur study notes to see how they compare to some of his other notes and other people. And so there are lots of great study Bibles out there that are worth, uh, that are worth the amount of money that they are. Some of them can be a little overpriced, and I can tell you if they are or not, but most of them you can find now between 40 and 50 bucks for a good study Bible. And again, you wait around Christmas time, you may be able to catch them Good Friday for even even cheaper than that. So a study Bible would be a good start. Uh, a good Bible concordance, this will help you kind of... Uh, now, here's the thing. With, with, our, with our smartphones uh, and, and AI now, concordances, um, I rarely have to turn to one. I, if I can't remember where something is in the Bible, I kind of know part of the verse, I can start typing it in, in my web browser, and all of a sudden, it'll come up. So it, it, concordance is not quite as... Um, at least a paperback is not quite as useful maybe as it once was, but it's still, if you can get your hands on one. And let me just say this as well. Uh, let me give you a little insider trading. I rarely buy books brand new anymore. Uh, eBay has become my biggest friend. I buy my, or Facebook marketplace. Uh, I have a young man who is, lives in Kennesaw, who is selling a systematic, a four volume systematic theology set that I've wanted along with um, a, a lot of about, I don't know, six or eight books on the person of Christ. Uh, he's trying to, to sell off some of his books to raise money to get out of debt. And so I'm going to get that whole set, all those books, for 160 bucks from him, uh, where that would probably cost me, if I bought them all brand new, well over $200. Um, so Facebook Marketplace or eBay. Um, I was able to get one of my interns a whole set of commentaries for 75 bucks. I'm a pastor who had just retired and was just trying to sell off his library, didn't want it anymore. Okay, so that's another way you could probably find, if you're good with a few highlights and markings, you could probably find some study Bibles in there uh, on eBay uh, for, for really cheap. And so just something to think about. But you can find uh, most of these resources like that if you don't want to buy them brand new. If you're really, really, really into biblical languages, you can get a Greek or Hebrew dictionary and start kind of figuring out how all that kind of plays out. That's an option for you. Um, copies of the confessions and the creeds. I mentioned this one of the last couple of Sundays. When heresies arose in the early church, confessions and creeds were written to combat or be an apologetic to those heresies. And so those things are based out of Scripture. They're not Scripture. I'm not saying they are Scripture. But we as Southern Baptists, we have our own confession. We call it the Baptist Faith and Message. So we, we, it's not that we're foreign to these documents. We have them ourselves and have had, had, them, have had them almost since our entire inception as a convention. And so the creeds and the confessions of the church are wonderful, wonderful tools that kind of help you. They help systematize thoughts about certain subjects. And they're wonderful to read. They're wonderful to, to use uh, alongside Scripture as part of medit uh, meditating and stuff and understanding the scriptures. So I encourage those. Uh, theological dictionary, uh, to be able to, to define different theological terms, uh, stuff like that. Uh, a systematic theology, which a systematic theology, whether it's a one volume or a multi-volume, what those are helpful for is that they kind of take uh, the different uh, genres, if you will, of theology, and they kind of concise, they kind of con con make them concise into certain uh, uh, teachings and stuff. And so you're able to find the passages on those things and explanations about those things. And so, like when we talk about this past Sunday, the the doctrine of Christ or Christology. All right, the sermon was based on that doctrine this past Sunday. But uh, it was not a full-blown doctrine of Christ. Uh, there's no way I could have, uh, in 40 minutes, given you a full-blown doctrine of Christ. That would be a multi-hour thing. But you can find 
a systematic theology that's written specifically just on that subject, and you get a fuller, broader thing. And again, with systematic theologies, uh, if you would go in my library, you would find that I have systematic theologies from a variety of different uh, Christian faith traditions under the umbrella of orthodoxy. Because I love to read from, from men and women who, have, who think a little bit different than I do, who see things a little bit different than I do, it helps me get a broader picture about those specific doctrines. And then I'm able to take that information and synthesize it and decide, okay, where do I land on any one of these particular issues? Um, some web resources that are free, one that I discovered kind of randomly that I have fallen in love with, blueletterbible.com. It has got a ton of study resources it's got all the translations there. You can pull up Strong's Concordance to look at the Greek and Hebrew translations and all that kind of stuff if you're into kind of that stuff. I, I was using it today, in fact, in finishing up this Sunday sermon. Uh, uh, BibleStudyTools.com is another uh, website. I think LIFO actually owns that one. Um, and so it uh, integrates not only uh, some of the very resources we talked about, but other resources that are out there to help understand the Bible better. Um, listen, sometimes we joke about the maps in the back of our Bible. Those things are, can be helpful. Uh, I, was, I was in 2 Kings earlier this week, and it was talking about some things that, in my mind, I just could not, I couldn't picture where they were at. I flipped over the maps, looked at it, figured it all out, and what I read made more sense, because now in my mind, I know where everything is. And so a good Bible atlas uh, that you can get, you can find those on eBay as well, or even Facebook Marketplace perhaps. Those are a wonderful tool uh, as you're reading, especially in the Old Testament, trying to figure out where all these places are and who's coming from where and that kind of stuff. So, um, so those are some, some good examples. All right, number four. Um, all right, we've got time for two more. Uh, using the tools of biblical hermeneutics, Determine what is the what what the authors are trying to do with the relevant biblical text. All right, so hermeneutics, in other words, just a, a right study of the Bible. So using the right steps to study the Bible. So the first thing that is important when you're studying the Bible is what is the genre of the text. So we have the Bible here, but these are not all the same types of literature in this one book. Who can, who can name off some of the different types of literature we have in the Bible? Matthew. Poetic. So we have poems. Very good. What else? Historical. Very good. Prophecy. Very good. Epistles. Very good. Gospels or narratives. Very good. Missing anything? Apocalyptic, which would be prophecy. It's like Daniel, Revelation, apocalyptic literature. I think through. We have, oh, we have the law, the first five books. We have law, right? Which also kind of, in some ways, like Genesis and Exodus reads a lot like a narrative, but we consider it law. So lots of different genres. So what genre am I in? So that's, that's a great starting point. The second thing I would say to this is uh, read the immediate context of each text, okay? In other words, don't just cherry pick verses out of the Bible. Read what's before it, Read what's right after it. Kind of get an idea of what's going on. Let me show you how even ordained, seasoned Baptist pastors can mess this up. So when I was in Louisiana, I served on the Youth Evangelism Conference leadership team, which basically myself and about, I don't know, 15 other youth pastors in the state, we met with our state youth ministry strategist to plan this massive youth ministry conference. So we get to the planning meeting, and he is just so giddy. Like, he's normally not this giddy for the meetings, but he is so excited. He's like, guys, man, I have found the most incredible verse as our theme verse for this year's YEC. We're like, man, well, tell us. So he goes in his Bible, and he goes, it's Habakkuk 1.5. Now, you don't have to turn there. I'm going to read it for you. Uh, it may be on the screen. I don't know if I, I put it or not, uh, but I'll read it anyway. Habakkuk 1.5. And so none of us open our Bibles. We trust this guy, right? He is our state youth ministry strategist. And this is what he read. Look at the nations and observe. Be utterly astounded, for I am doing something in your days that you will not believe when you hear about it. We're like, 
That's awesome. Like, I think our, I don't know, our, our theme was something like worldwide or global or continental or something. And it's like, he's, this is great, man. We, we want God to do something with our students that, that is something that's going to have a worldwide effect. And we're all like, yeah, bunch of young youth pastors. We didn't know any better. So I drive back home. Man, I'm excited from this meeting. Habakkuk one. Like, who reads Habakkuk? When's the last time you heard a sermon in Habakkuk, right? Like, we're going we're gonna to blow these students' minds to open my Bible to Habakkuk. I'm going to read that again. I read verse 5. I'm excited. I'm like, man, I'm going to keep reading. Verse 6. Look, I'm raising up the Chaldeans, that bitter, impetuous nation that marches across the earth's open spaces to seize territories not its own. They are fierce and terrifying. Their views of justice and sovereignty stem from themselves. Their horses are swifter than leopards and more fierce than wolves of the night. Their horsemen charge ahead. Their horsemen come from distant lands. They fly like eagles swooping to devour. All of them come to do violence. Their faces are set in determination. They gather prisoners like sand. They mock kings and rulers are a joke to them. They laugh at every fortress and build siege ramps to capture it. They sweep in like the wind and pass through. They are guilty. Their strength is their God. What was God doing with this incredible look at the nations observed? What was he, what were they about to be earlier astounded? Israel's about to get conquered. <laughs> God was saying, Watch what's about to happen. You're going to be amazed at what I'm about to do to Israel because of their disobedience. So I called my friend up. I said, hey, bud. I said, um, I said hey, get your Bible. Go back to Habakkuk 1.5 for a second. So he got his Bible. I said, read it for me again, man, because this is so good. He's, he's so giddy. He's right. I said, now, now read 6 through 10. And the tone of his voice got lower and lower and lower. I said, I don't think we can use Habakkuk 5. <laughs> I won 5. I just don't think it's going to work. And we, we changed plans. Thank goodness the artwork hadn't been created. And we didn't get too far in the process. But that's an example. It was an innocent you know, mistake. But that's what happens when we cherry pick a verse because it sounds good. But we don't have the immediate context around it. So be very, very careful when you're doing that. Now listen, there are some verses that are strong enough to stand on their own. But it's always important to read before and after and get the uh, immediate context. Um, some other things to consider about when you're, when you're doing this, gather information on the historical context and cultural background of a passage, okay? So again, this is where some of the study, like a study Bible, other online resources help you understand the background so that you better understand things, okay? Okay. Um, uh, make sense of each passage in its larger context. So not just the immediate context, but what does this passage say about in the entire chapter that I'm reading or the entire section of a book or the entire book or letter or whatever however you want to refer to it. So understanding it's a larger context and that helps you get a better idea. Um, establish the main purpose of the text. And so here's one of the, the biggest rules that I can give you. As you read something, ask the question, is it prescriptive or is it descriptive so that's not going to be up there so you can write that down is it prescriptive or is it descriptive in other words if it's prescriptive it is prescribing or commanding that i do something okay so when the bible describes about david's adultery of bathsheba is god prescribing that we should commit adultery thank you <laughs> no all right, that should have been a lot firmer, quicker, no from everybody. All right, no. That is what we would call descriptive. It is describing an event or something that is happening. And so that is a critical mistake that people who misinterpret parts of the Bible will do. They will call what is prescriptive descriptive, and they will call what is descriptive prescriptive. So be very careful as you're reading. Use that as a lens to filter what you're reading. And what I'm reading, is it, is it prescribing? Is it commanding that I do something? Or is it simply just describing something that happened? All right, and let me see if I'm forgetting anything else. Uh, that's it. All right, number five, last one for tonight. Place the theological theme of the text in the larger story of Israel or the church and then the grand narrative of Scripture fulfilled in Christ. Okay, So as you're looking at that passage, how does it fit in 
say Israel in the Old Testament, the church in the New Testament, or how does it fit in the overall grand scheme of the Bible that everything that has been fulfilled in Christ? And so <clears throat> one way to look at it is looking at the Bible in five acts, okay? So act one, God creates all things. So we have the creation narratives that bring us right up to act two, which act two would be God calling or electing Israel to be his people. I will be your God, you will be my people. God chooses Israel and takes this nation of nobodies and makes it into his nation, his people, all right? And so that starts a brand new act in, in the whole uh, narrative of Scripture. Uh, and then we get to Act 3, which is the start of the New Testament, where Jesus comes as the Messiah. And so we have the Gospels as Act as Acts chapter 3. Uh, act 4, uh, we see the book of Acts is that we go from God electing or choosing a nation to himself to God electing or choosing a church to himself. A nation or a church of what? Every nation, tribe, and tongue. So God, in both the Old Covenant, the Old Testament, the New Covenant, he is choosing, he is electing a people to himself. So there is continuity from one to the other. One is a nation, the other is a church. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that actually this Sunday as we look at the menu of the table. Uh, and then Act 5 would be um, <clears throat> God will bring current history to an end with the return of Christ, the consummation of the kingdom, and the establishment of the new heaven and the new earth. So what, as, as I'm reading, how does that fit in the five acts of the Bible? That's you know, not the Acts of the Apostles, or as I heard one pastor say it this week, uh, or the pastor or somebody, I, I heard this, which I like a lot better, the Acts of the Holy Spirit. Uh, like, I like that. It's kind of a, a, this is what the Holy Spirit was doing as he came upon the church and started doing incredible things. So use either one. It doesn't matter if you call it Acts of the Apostles, great, Acts of the Holy Spirit, or just Acts, either way is fine. But in the five Acts, if you will, like a play, we see in Scripture God laying these things out. What am I reading? Which act does it fall in? Because it helps me to better interpret what's going on. Because here's the last thing I'll tell you, and then we'll, we'll be done for tonight on our teaching time. <clears throat> there is, in proper study of God's Word, there is a correct interpretation, but there can be many different applications. Okay? There are not many different interpretations in the sense of uh, on the solid theological things, right? We can have, we can believe that Christ is coming back and we can look at some of the side things about when that might happen a little bit differently and still be in the orthodoxy, right? But the applications of how we apply Scripture can vary. In other words, I, I mentioned last week about me reading that passage in 2021 about the children coming home. I, the, the, the interpretation was of the children of Israel would be led back home. But God, knowing the, the burden of my heart for my own children and their spiritual condition, that was a reminder for me that, hey, don't worry, I've got your kids. The children will come home. So there's times that we can have, uh, you know, I, I read it that way that morning. Somebody else could have read that same passage that day in Jeremiah and either that the Holy Spirit never even illuminated that verse or if he did, could have a whole totally different application for that person. So the application could be different. Uh, when I always had application, I think about John 21, when, when Jesus goes to, to Peter and restores him, and, and Peter says, well, what about him? Pointing to John, and Jesus is like, don't worry about him. What I have for him is of no consequence to you. You worry about what I have for you, and let him worry about what I have for him. And so, you know, that's what I think the beauty of the, the body of Christ is God calls Northlake to to do some things that he doesn't call Corinth Church to do or he doesn't call Blackshire Place in South Hall or doesn't call North Hall Church to do or any other church. There are some things that God just calls us to do. And if he calls us to do it, our responsibility is to be obedient and to trust him with all the details in that.
All right, we'll stop there for tonight. We'll do the other five next week. And uh, I'll try to bring some of my, re- I meant to do that tonight, was bring some of those resources that I have in my library. If some of you wanted just to fumble and look through them. Uh, but we got in a kind of a rush right before church, so I forgot, but I'll do that next week. So for our folks online, thank you for joining us. And I'm going to pray and uh, we'll then move into our corporate prayer time. Father, tonight we thank you that you have blessed us with uh, wonderful theologians. Uh, both modern and of, and of the past, who are solid uh, uh, readers of your word and are knowledgeable and can help us with some great tools to help those of us who may not have all the same skill set to know and understand your word better. But God, there's not a better tool that we have than the Holy Spirit that lives inside of us, who can illuminate for us exactly what we're to do and exactly what your word says. So I pray that we will trust the leading of the Holy Spirit that we would spend time in your word, we'd have that place, we'd have that plan, and we'd have that positive um, um, uh, spirit, uh, that positive mindset to know that you will speak and that when you speak, we're to be obedient, we're to listen, and we're to trust you uh, and so that we can grow in our experience with you, grow in our knowledge of you, and grow in our faith. Lord, that's our prayer. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.